Hello, family of ours, our dear Haunted Heart listeners. Family for better or for worse. For sickness. Mostly just for worse. Uh, yeah, sickness and in health. Mostly just sickness. Uh, told death do his part. <laughs> And yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until we yeah. all die from this fucking nonsense. Yeah. I am feeling the sickness bit of that today because my left nostril is just like trying to trying to drip on me all day. That's what's going on. That's, drip, that's but not in a good way, right? Like, Can you drip in a good way? Mm-hmm. I think that's what the kids are saying nowadays. Like, Really? Oh, it's a thing. Drip, oh, I you know thought you were I mean? talking it's about like, the spooky smut. Like, Oh, oh! Well. I thought you were talking about Patreon content. <laughs> the spooky no, no. So the kids are saying drip. Yeah. Oh, like, like they used to say yeet. No, yeet is like I'm gonna yeet your ass out of my life. Like toss, your, like that's like to toss. Yeet oh. is to toss. Yeet is to toss. Yeah. I didn't know it was a verb. I thought it was just something they screamed. Yeet. Yeet. Yeah. And then it's they like, just kind of. Yeah. You. Like that eat. vine with the girl with the water bottle? Yeah, she threw the water bottle to oh. toss. So that's what it means. Yeah. Yeet. Oh, so that was like a definition this whole time. Yeah. Oh, I had no idea. <laughs> no idea. God, we're getting old. So now they say drip? Well, I think it's not in the same context, but yeah, I believe drip is a... Uh... So you... You know what? Where's my... Well, I... Uh... Weather's nice today. Had a nice walk. Hold on. Got a peanut butter milkshake, what's and that? I could just drip. What's that? Like, is that like? how it works? No. What's the Urban uh, Dictionary? Urban Dictionary. We're urban. gonna do that live <laughs> right we are now. Old. The one thing that I, you know, what I love about modern technology is that I can just completely Google something and spell it wrong and not care, and then it just like <laughs> comes up anyway. <laughs> yeah. Like I re- literally just typed in drip Urban Dictionary. <laughs> Yeah. And it, guess what pulled up? You just type a random assortment of letters and right. Google's like, did you mean tachycardiogram? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Pretty yeah, much. I did mean that. Um, I'm not sure what that says about us as a society now, but anyway. Yeah. It means uh, we've been handicapped and coddled. <laughs> yes. to, uh, we've been coddled into stupidity. Pretty much. That's fine. Uh, that's just one step uh, for the AI taking over, I'm assuming. Uh, right? Drip. Means when you when your bling is iced out, but that shit melting from all your hot bars, you got the drip. It's just another word for immense swag. I thought you were to say immense sweat, and I was like, oh, this word should be me. Yeah. Or and number you. two is uh, lingo started around Jersey City in early 2014 to describe one's outfit or overall demeanor. Got it. Okay. So it's you like a Cardi drip. B song yeah. came through dripping. You got that drip, yeah. You got you got that drip, yeah. It seems like that might be a way to tell people that you're on your period too, though. <laughs> like we could claim it for that. I'm on that drip, I'm girl. On my drip. Oh, you better back up. Wow. I heard she on the drip. Many things uh, that uh, you could have anal leakage. You could. You know. You could. Your Ugh. left nostril could again be. I don't You're actually just, think it's running. I think I just think that it's running, and so I want to sniff so bad, but I am very aware that our listeners' ears are right next to my lips, as always, <laughs> and I do not want to just aggressively sniff in their ear. No. no. Unless they're into that. Well, Send we us an a, email yeah. at thehauntedheartpodcast.gmail.com. Yeah. Or donate to our Patreon. It's a Patreon tier. We can make that for you. <laughs> yes, we can. We can do anything <laughs> for you there. Honestly. <laughs> Truly. Truly. I think uh, that last smut we read was just. <sighs> it was a lot. It's a it lot. was a lot. Yeah. yeah. Check it out. If you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about our Patreon page where we do uh, spooky stories and we do spooky smut. And the spooky smut is a lot of fun. We'd love to share it with you. But you can see us at patreon.com slash the haunted heart. Um, and you can see us there. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't mean for that to sound as pluggish and shitty as it did. They're like, we don't even know what you're talking but about on this what? episode, and you're asking for me to give you money. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what are we talking about on this episode? Bitch, I don't know. So listen, you last week we talked about uh, the underground of uh, yeah, we haunted talked about places. my soul leaving my body. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, there <laughs> was some ghosts, some some body snatchers, lots of piss and shit. Um. If you haven't checked it out, please do. It was a riveting episode. 
Um, and you told me that, like, on the way, you were like, this is what you're going to research, so this is what you need to do. And I'm like, okay, take charge kind of gal. I mean, let's do it. Yeah. Um, I'm an on-top type of chick. This is uh, this is kind of interesting. So we're talking about... Kind of interesting. <laughs> not, not fully. <laughs> um, we don't want you to get too excited about it, so we're going to temper it down a little bit. That's our own insecurity coming out is what that is. No, we're talking about psychics this week. In particular, psychics and how they are involved or get themselves involved i guess i don't know this is really awkward intro with uh cases yeah Criminal, true crime cases. true crime ca- <laughs> true crime i like how we're a true crime podcast Kenny. great job with cases catch case with the with the, <laughs> with the guy you know when a guy does something wrong usually it's a guy yeah. sometimes uh, it's a girl yeah no. Uh, we haven't done a true crime case in a while, and uh, so we're going to kind of dip back into that realm today. Um, there's a lot to talk about with psychics and clairvoyance. Today, we're going to err more on the side of um, of true crime, of how psychics get involved with and help solve potentially cases. Um, but, you know, that's not to say that at some point we won't revisit the psychic topic and kind of explore it from a uh, more... I guess like paranormal, spiritual, sense. metaphysical yeah. standpoint of like how um, clairvoyance actually works and those sorts of things. Um, but today we're going to stick a little closer to the realm of true crime and we're going to talk about psychic detectives. Psychic detective. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It sounds like a, like a sitcom of some sorts. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so a psychic detective is a person who investigates crimes by using purported paranormal psychic abilities. Trademark. Why did you say it like that? Because that is the literal definition, 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 definition. if you will, of a psychic detective that I looked up online to kick off purported. this episode. Purported. 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 Does that mean like, what's the difference between purported and reported? Or well, does purported mean like supposed? Like, it's not necessarily yeah, been think, reported because that means confirmation. Uh-huh. Is it a skeptical I word? I think so. Like, this is a purported podcast. You're purported. <laughs> <laughs> You're purported. <laughs> it sounds, the more you say it, the more it sounds like porpoise. Purported. Poor porpoise. Purported. <laughs> you were purported to talk about psychics on this episode, but that was a lie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it does show that that was a lie. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there are a lot of different psychic abilities that go into psychic detectives. You have postcognition, which is the paranormal perception of the past, sort of a looking back um, and having memories that aren't necessarily yours. Um, psychometry, which is a really hard word to say correctly, and I'm so glad that I got it because when you look at it, it just looks like psychometry. psychometry. But I didn't want to do that. <laughs> Because I always cringe when, like, I'm listening to a podcast and they go, psycho psychopathy? Who oh, God. Psychopathy. It hurts me. It hurts me deep in my soul. Psychopathy. Yeah. There are a lot of podcasts that I love a lot that, that will do that. And I'm like, I love you, but why do you hurt me this way? Um, anyway, psychometry is information that is psychically gained from objects. So this is kind of like how on That's So Raven, oh. how they, like hand her a backpack and she like takes the backpack and she's like Ugh! and then she, she has like, the the Whoa. moment where she's yeah. just like Psh! yeah like the o the face yeah. yeah that <laughs> that mm-hmm. um and then more common things that we're uh familiar with telepathy clairvoyance uh and um also dousing and remote viewing interesting that dowsing is on there yeah i guess because I always looked at that as more of like a paranormal, like ghost type thing. You know, when they use the dowsing rods, and if the mm-hmm. dowsing rods cross, then that is like a uh, uh, indicator of paranormal activity because of the electromagnetic fields. Yeah, I mean, I guess their um, the argument for including that in this list might be that you have to have some degree of psychic ability in order to pick up on that sensitivity, like to mm. have the sensitivity to to feel that, I guess, through the dowsing rod. Got it, got it, got it. Or it could be a trick that was made up by people who were trying to convince people to invest in their land because it had oil. 
It could be also that. But <laughs> that'll be on the dousing episode. That. We're going to ignore that <laughs> one. <laughs> We're going to ignore that one today. Yes. So in murder cases, psychic detectives may purport. Purport! Which is the new word of the day. To be in communication with the spirits of the murder victims directly. So okay. you guys know we're fairly open-minded here at the Haunted Heart. Yeah. Right. Are we? Yeah. We're okay. Pretty, I, I think we are. Okay. I think that's okay. Pretty, I think it's pretty on brand. Um, <laughs> we're, we're a pretty spooky bunch of motherfuckers who understand that everything that goes bump in the night isn't necessarily just the house settling. Yes. Yeah. Totally. So it should come as no surprise that we both have some measure of belief in clairvoyance and various other psychic abilities. Uh huh. I mean, I I realize that I'm kind of speaking for you there. I I think that you do. <laughs> I certainly do. I have um, a belief in clairvoyance and some psychic abilities. Yes. Do you? Now that uh, I've told everyone that you do, <laughs> do you? So here's my thing. Um, I don't necessarily know. I guess it could be one and the same, but I fall more in line with the idea that yes, I believe that certain things can leave around, um, leave a residue around, like that spiritual or emotional residue. And I think mm. certain people could tap into that, but I don't think that those people, I don't know necessarily that I believe that that is something that anyone has the will to summon themselves. Like, I don't know that anyone can, I don't know that I believe that anyone can just go up to say like, you know, this candle beside me and then just automatically pick up on, you know, any energies that that has. The Yankee candle, like <laughs> represented the angst of the Yankee candle representative that sold it to us. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I just don't, uh, I think that it would have to be something that, I don't know. I just feel like that that's something that's more in um, the environment and in the object and and not necessarily something that's like within someone else. Yeah, that I it's a two-way street. So obviously the psychic, well, I guess not, not obviously. Um, but I kind of get your point that the, the psychic is not necessarily the person or the um, – spirit that is driving the activity right, right so right. that it's a two-way street where there has to be some measure of outreach from the other side right. that the psychic then is sensitive to and can kind of pick up on and engage yeah. with but it's not necessarily the psychic who's like driving exactly the, the and that's why yeah. i'm always I agree so with you on wary it. on on psychics in general, mm -hmm. especially those that do it for, you know, they There's get paid the to I do it. I knew it was going to happen. I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I I finally gave in. I didn't hear it, though. At least we made it a while. They will. They will fucking hear it. I'm very sorry. Um, Especially those that, uh, we're not doing cocaine, folks. I we're promise not. you, I just, we're not. Having... Just look at our energy. Just listen to our energy levels, <laughs> honestly. If we ever come on here and we just sound like really into it and energetic, Maybe. Call somebody. Call someone. Uh, but no, I. that's why I always like side-eye those people that like you see on TV that like yeah. do this and that. And I'm like. Miss Cleo? Mm, oh, yeah. I don't know about, I don't know. I'm not going to say about Miss Cleo because Miss Cleo is a 90s staple. <laughs> okay. And I can't say anything, but I'm looking at like um, Long Island Medium. Like, yeah. That's that, Ther what's her yeah. name? Teresa Caputo. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Mm. Sorry, Teresa, if you're listening, but yeah. <laughs> sorry, girl. So, yeah, that's a fair point. And today's topic is a particularly tough one because in a lot of these cases, especially the particularly difficult ones involving missing and murdered children, there's a huge potential for manipulation and exploitation and all that bullshit. So we want to address the dark side of the topic first before we dig into some cases where it's possible that psychics purportedly, purported, right, were able to successfully help advance the investigation in some way. Um, so we gonna look, we gonna read it first. Yes, and then we'll talk about some cases where, or you're gonna talk about a case where, um, where there potentially was some psychic interaction. Um, but we wanted to make sure that our beliefs were on the table and out in the open before we kind of started digging in. Um, so. 
Let's talk about this old nasty bitch named <laughs> Sylvia Brown. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, nasty bitch. So in November of 2004, purported. <laughs> Everyone. I'm just putting that word everywhere. Now. They're like, if they say this fucking like, word. Could you please one more fucking God stop. damn time. Um, so Sylvie Brown, who supposedly, purportedly, metaphysically. Spiritually, let's, let's turn a this into cake. let's turn this into a drinking game, y'all. As many times, like every time we say the word or a version of purported, take a drink. Christy, I'm looking at you. Yeah. Oh, she knows. She knows where this where this road is fucking headed. She's familiar with this case. Christy is our one of our murder mod squad uh, members on the Facebook group. So shout her out if you know her. Um, so November 2004, um, Sylvia Brown tells the mother of kidnapping victim Amanda Berry, uh, who had disappeared 19 months earlier, quote, she's not alive, honey. End quote. Brown also claimed to have had a vision of Berry's jacket in the garbage with, quote, DNA on it. End quote. Very specific. Mm, Yeah. Any jacket that any person has ever worn ever or touched in a clothing store, um, has or brushed past in a clothing store, yeah, has DNA on it, so not very specific there. Yeah. Um, Barry's mother died two years after that, after being told that, believing that her daughter had been killed, um, because she didn't have any information, the police didn't really have any leads at that point, and she kind of went off of what this psychic told her, which is that her child is dead. Um, so Barry was actually found alive in May 2013, having been a kidnapping vis- victim of Ariel Castro, along with Michelle Knight and Gina De Jesus. And after Barry was found alive, Brown received criticism for the false declaration that Barry was dead. But this bitch, like, that wasn't just her, that wasn't her only thing. Like, she has, like, a long track record of fucking shit up. Oh, okay. Um... So she also was involved in the case of Sean Hornbeck, um, which received the attention of a bunch of different psychics after um, he was, Sean was 11 years old and he went missing on October 6th of 2002. And for some reason, for some fucking reason, it's always the missing cases because the police investigate and then they, you know, hit a wall and maybe the case goes cold or maybe there's like a a momentary stall. Maybe it's not even all the way cold yet. Um, but missing cases get a lot of psychic attention, which I understand. But for some reason, these people always involve themselves in fucking cases where children are missing. And it's like they always swoop in and start trying to talk to the parents. And I'm like, could you could you not? Could you work with the police? Could you not target the family, please? Yeah. Uh-uh. And I get that the police are kind of, the police are inherently fact-based, and a lot of police officers don't want to kind of look into the more, like, metaphysical side of things, and I get that, because sometimes, you can waste a lot of fucking time doing that, mm-hmm. um, honestly. And you guys know that we are, like, totally hippy-dippy spiritual mumbo-jumbo people, but, like, I'm kind of cool that cops aren't. Well, you need that balance, right? Maybe you like- could have, like, one witchy bitch. On the squadron. I'll do it. I'll volunteer. <laughs> I'll be our area's witchy bitch, right? And she just hangs around. Like, what is what is the cops, like, the precinct? Like, yeah, their office? Yes. Yeah. Like, she just hangs around the precinct. The police and station? Smokes. Yeah, the station. That's the one. She just hangs around and smokes clothes and, like, dresses, like, to the nines in goth, goth professional chic fashion. And, and leans not on a police people's, uniform? She just le- no, n- definitely not a police uniform. She smokes clothes and leans on people's desks. And that's her job, right? And her job is to be like, her job is to talk to the fucking psychics, right? <laughs> so that the police don't have to waste their time. And then when she has something that like works, that, that, that might be a lead, then maybe we can bring that to the cops. But we can just go ahead and let the cops work in the realm of fact like and like... Science. I'm I, cool with that. I'm into the story, though. Right? I mean, this could be a nice pilot for, like, a TV right? show. I am writing a pilot right now <laughs> to you guys. This oh is it. Oh, my God. This is it. Let's I'm film it. I'm into it. it. I would yes. watch it. I'm going to script it. It's going to be fine. 
Um, it's going to be like that Kira Sedgwick show, except it's going to be me leaning and smoking <laughs> and sniffing. Anyway. <clears throat> or like the aunt from... Um... Uh, from Sabrina. From Sabrina. Yeah, yeah that's kind of what I picture right now. <laughs> but a little more free spirited. Yeah. Like, you know, it's fine. Um, she likes to have a good time sometimes. So, for some reason, these people always um, tend to involve themselves in cases of missing children. And it might be that they see the parents, that the more unscrupulous folks see the parents as easy targets. It might be that some of them, like, have genuine um, intentions. And they want to help the parents because they see it as a really desperate situation. But unfortunately, they don't actually have the connections that they need or whatever. Um, but that is kind of what happened in the Hornbeck case. He went missing on October 6, 2002. And Sylvia Brown gets involved. Um, he was 11 years old when he went missing. And she went on the Montel Williams show and provided his parents, Sean's parents, a detailed description of the abductor and where he could be found. And when they asked if Sean was still alive, again, on the show, so all of this shit was televised, it's fucking disgusting, um, Sylvia Brown said no. Uh. Okay, so when he was found alive more than four years later, they started looking at the receipts... And they found that a lot of the details that she gave about the abductor were, like, totally incorrect. They were totally off base. Um, so, basically, she didn't know what the fuck she was talking about. Oh, of course not. It's very clear. Of course not. Um, thankfully, Hornbeck was found alive and, you know, reunited with his parents, which was great. It was very unfortunate um, in the Barry case that, you know, Amanda Barry was never reunited with her mother because her mother had passed away. Mm-hmm. Um. Sean Hornback's father, though, Craig Akers, has stated that Brown's declaration was one of the hardest things we've ever had to hear. And that her misinformation diverted investigators, which wasted pre- precious police time. Which is another thing that, um, that causes me to be a little bit split on the whole psychic involvement in criminal investigation. Is like... It can waste resources. It can waste. It can waste a lot of resources. Like if if you're looking for a five foot six, like Caucasian guy, like who is wearing a red jacket, who was in like I don't know Lubbock, Texas, but the actual perpetrator is a six foot one, like Asian American man who you know, is in a t-shirt in New Hampshire, you know, it it just kind of, you can go on a lot of wild goose chases and that doesn't help the child be found in the meantime. Like Sean Hornbeck spent four years away from home and like how much of that time was spent investigating these incorrect details that Sylvia Brown had kind of infused into the case. Right. And it's it's the job of investigators to stay sort of open-minded and not commit to any one thing, which sometimes they do that better than other times. Um, but, yeah, it just... By going on something... I, I don't mean to shit on the metaphysical because I'm totally all about that, but when you leave the realm of science and you start going down a path that is like not easily defined because anybody who is involved with things like clairvoyance and any type of magic and that sort of thing, it's not specific. It's not fact-based. It's not science-based. It, it's very hard to pin down. And that's not necessarily the way that we solve murder cases, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so we have to say once and for all, fuck that and fuck you, Sylvia Brown, (laughs) personally from the heart and heart. (laughs) XOXO. XOXO. Fuck you. Fuck off. Um, if you don't have the site, but you like to be seen, like, I feel like there's a lot of people who, who are in that situation. They don't have the site, but they like to be seen on things like the Montel Williams show on things like Maury and shit like that. Um, so they set themselves up as a fake psychic so that they can manipulate the families of missing children for screen time for themselves. Right. And to those people, we say a resounding, a fuck, fuck you. you. To the moon. <laughs> to the moon and never back. 
Um, uh, yeah, no, I completely agree. I think that it's absolutely abhorrable that uh, that people would do that. And they do that, I think, because they feel like that nothing is going to happen with the case or yeah. whatever it is, you know, so they feel like that it's an easy way for them to, like you said, put their name out um, or have yeah. other people like they look at it as a business opportunity. Yeah. Which and is disgusting. If you start unpacking that thought pattern that by doing that, you are literally betting on that child never being found. Right. Because you have, and either way you put it, like, especially like you have declared, she sat there and said that, no, your child is not alive. So mm-hmm. she placed that bet with everyone mm-hmm. that that child was not going to be alive. And she banked on him not being alive. Mm. And that is disgusting. Yeah. And anyone who has, and anybody who is involved in any sort of um, uh, metaphysical art or any of that knows that like, like even me, like being as much of a skeptic as I am with a lot of things, uh, even I like read tarot cards, but also know that like nothing is ever really set in stone. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. you can't like, and that's the other thing that gets me is that I'm very like wary of anyone who's just comes out with the resounding like, yes, they're dead. Or yes, this yeah. is what's going to happen. Yeah. No, this is not going to happen. Like right. you can't, like that's not how things work because mm-hmm. everything is so fluid around us and any little adjustment with anything like causes that like ripple effect that can change like right and it's not so specific it's not you know maybe instead of you know i use the example of somebody predicting that the killer or perpetrator or whatever of a crime is wearing a red jacket well maybe it's not that he's wearing a red jacket maybe it's that you know the the crime took place in a red room yeah or maybe he drove a red car right or you know, so i'm i'm or a red state You never know. (laughs) (laughs) I'm suspicious of, you know, people who, like you said, put put it down in those excruciating details of, you know, it was a red jacket. Yeah. Okay. Well, whereas if somebody who's like, okay, somehow red was involved. Right. I'm seeing red. I'm feeling red. I'm feeling like some sort of. And I don't, like, I don't know why. Right. Like, I can't pinpoint it, but I am seeing red. Something like that. Like, I would be more, I mean, more inclined to like, okay, maybe believe this person or like take that into consideration as opposed to someone's like, Oh, this person's killer was wearing a red jacket. They had on white sneakers. They were seven foot tall. You know, they had on, right. you know, fucking, they were listening to so-and-so when they were driving down the car with this person in the trunk of their, like, I can't do that. Like, yeah. that's hard for me. I can't and there that. actually is an example of a case where a psychic was involved, that a psychic sort of correctly, sort of correctly predicted the perpetrator of a crime. It was um, the murder of Penny Sarah in 1973, July 16th. Um, Police were unsuccessful in finding her killer, but they turned to a psychic named uh, Pascarella Downey. And Downey told them that they wouldn't find Sarah's murder right away, but to look for a mechanic whose name started with an E. And she predicted that they would connect him to the crime by blood evidence in some way. Um, So 26 years later, a quarter of a century, over a quarter of a century, um, they connected Edward Grant, formerly a mechanic, to the murder after a DNA blood test connected him to the death of Sarah. Mm. And he, by the way, was convicted and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison in 2002. Wow. Yeah. So... Those sorts of situations, like you said, I'm much, I'm much more likely to um, not necessarily believe, but I feel like it's it's more genuine. Um, well, I feel like that's how the information is given to you. Like if you have that gift, like like yeah. I feel like that's more of like a raw thing. That's yes, like it's more you. genuine. It's more honest. Like, I feel like if the person says, okay, you know, I can't give you everything that you need to solve this, but I'm, I feel like the person's name started with an E. I feel like he did some sort of trade job, like a mechanic, like, and I'm, I'm, I'm 
feeling like blood is going to be what solves this case. Like that to me is more of a believable message from a psychic than, you know, oh, it happened on this day at this time at these coordinates at like all the really specific stuff. Because if you look at people when people are lying, they have a tendency to be over like overly specific about things, which is why you guys know that we are never fucking lying to you (laughs) because we don't have any fucking specifics ever. (laughs) (laughs) This is true. This is very true. This is so true. Very minimal. So you know that we're genuine (laughs) because (laughs) we don't know what we're doing. No. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of, feel like that but i know that you went a little bit more in depth on a case where it does appear that the psychic involvement was um was genuine or was helpful or what have you yes i d- was i supposed to do that oh yeah oh, oh. Mm-hmm. Did you do <laughs> no, that i'm jk jk uh so i did actually so i actually found um Someone, and you may or may not have heard of her. Her name is Rosemary Kerr. Um, and so I'm the, I would like to thank a couple of places for this uh, information that I'm about to provide to you. One being the Weekly Wire, um, uh, written by Dalt Wonk. Uh, I'm fairly certain this was written in November 24th, November of 1997. Um, oh bless <laughs> that was like so, almost on microfiche <laughs> yes you at the microfiche machine just <laughs> clicking through scrolling through on like the little like the little uh what are they called the little joystick yeah thing <laughs> no one knows what the fuck we're talking about only the old listeners like us the oh elderly. my god i have to sidebar really quickly <laughs> i because you said joystick yeah and um so i was scrolling through I'm, I'm a little worried like what this fucking <laughs> sidebar is gonna be you said joystick and I'm like are we gonna talk about like street fighter or are we no. gonna talk about dicks so like well, this could go either way talk about dicks uh so Got I was it. scrolling through tiktok the other day and this uh little boy posted a video about like what men want when they're getting head or as he referred to it as slob um <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and um, no 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 is that a thing i guess is that so. like dripping maybe i mean you know like slob on my girl knob. you look like you on that drip could i get a little slob <laughs> a Things slob like job so messy no i think it's like like slob on my knob like cord on the cob <sighs> you never heard that song i hate that song but that's a wow song. i the fact that you know that makes me like momentarily doubt our friendship (laughs) i'm like whoa that just came off the tip of your tongue so easily yeah Mm, um that's bad don't please here's their public service announcement for this episode the first one i I guess this is the second one because the first one was fuck you sylvia brown um the second one is please don't call it slob Please don't call it that. Don't look at don't look at the person that you love or maybe the person that you don't love, maybe the person who you just felt was attractive at the time. Don't look at them and ask them to like slob on you. Please <laughs> Give don't. Give me some slob. Please don't do that. Yeah. I would I would literally get up somberly in silence <laughs> off of my knees and butt ass <laughs> naked. <laughs> I would gather my various items from the room. I would say no more. And then I would walk out of the door and into the night, still butt ass naked, but carrying all of my belongings. And I would call a cab. And I would never speak to that human being again. Is it specifically just for blowjobs or is it like head for women I too? It, I think it's probably just for blowjobs. But let I mean, me get I to honestly my point. I honestly see more slobber in, in giving head to a woman. But anyway... Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot involved. Probably it goes both so, ways. A lot. Um, no. So anyway, and one of his things was it's that like, park. you know, obviously no teeth, no this, no that. And it was like when the hair is pulled oh, back no in a ponytail. No teeth for the blood. Listen, not just everybody let likes me get that. to my fucking point. <laughs> Sorry. And one of them was a ponytail. And so the uh-huh. one thing about TikTok that I love is that usually like the top commenter is like absolutely thinking everything that I am. Yeah. And it's 
hilarious. And so I get on there and literally the first commenter was like, ponytail, you ain't fixing to use my fucking head like a joystick, motherfucker. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, but anyway. But you know what? That. If he told, if he asked you for slob... He probably is going to use your fucking head like a joystick. joystick. Like, that yeah. was your tip-off, baby. That was it. <laughs> that was it. Mm. So anyway, that was back really to tough. my point. <laughs> All right, back to my story, I should say. Got it. <laughs> Not to my point. All right, so when Elise McGinley decided to have a psychic reading... She didn't know that her brother, Andre, had disappeared two days earlier under suspicious circumstances. A co-worker in the auto rental agency where Elise worked suggested the reading. She had never dabbled in the paranormal before, but now she was living in California, home <laughs> of the new age. Well, now she was living in California, so it was uh-huh. a totally different story. She, yeah. She burned her bra. <laughs> <laughs> Went nips out for a psychic reading. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so she thought, why not? You know, let's, let me just do this. Um, so later on, she heard, she phoned her mother back home in Louisiana and learned of her brother's disappearance. So. The other siblings and their spouses and close friends had gathered at the family home in River Ridge to search for Andre. Elise might have chosen then and there to fly home and join the search. Instead, she decided to ask the psychic for help. Her decision was to have nearly miraculous results. Within hours of the psychic's reading and guided only by the psychic's message, members of Elise's family would track down and capture her brother's killers. That the Daigle family would lurk, would look, lurk, <laughs> would look for paranormal help was a clear sign of their desperation. For they were not merely just a; they were kind of like a normal family. They, um, it depends were, on the family. Technically, we're a normal family. Yeah. Well, I think we're talking about this is probably this was written in 1997, so normal. Got family. it. Hamburger helper family. Got it. Hamburger helper family. Exactly. Um, But they were very close, I guess is what it's trying to say. Um, Stanley Daigle, the father, was a retail jewelry salesman. Uh, His children had grown up together in a modest three-bedroom house. All the boys in one bedroom and all the girls in another. Modest. There's a word you didn't write. (laughs) There's a copy-paste word. (laughs) Yep. Kind of like purported. Modest. Andre, the missing brother, was the youngest boy. From an early age, he had shown athletic prowess. In high school, his team uh, won the state football championships. And by then, he had also taken up the guitar, which he would play for hours at a time. He was said to be very outgoing, energetic, very likable. Uh, Quote, he was the kind of person who would help people, his brother said. Oh, that's awesome. Um, At his funeral, what struck me most was that so many, many people came up and said that he was my best friend. Mm. At 27, Andre was a tall, handsome, well-built man man with dark hair, dark eyes, and a mustache. In Mm. his photographs, he has a confident, open smile. Uh, When his body was recovered from the Monchonk, I can't pronounce that, swamp, the autopsy revealed 11 fractures of the skull caused by a claw hammer. His Ugh. brains uh, had bl- been beaten out, um, and he had also been strangled. Some of the details of what happened on Tuesday, June 9th, 1987, the day that Andre was murdered, will remain a mystery mm-hmm. forever. But the broad outlines of the story are clear. Andre was working as a carpenter, do- uh, doing home renovations renovations in partnership with a lifelong friend named joe lapentino can we just say i know you're going you're taking us through the as you put it the broad outlines of the case Mm -hmm. um another copy paste phrase um can we just say though that andre sounds like he was like a bomb ass person like he was athletic but he also could play music because mm-hmm. he was like in yeah. a guitar. And like, it's rare that you have somebody that can kind of like do both because music is more creative, like, and athletes usually, I think most people think of them as um, more 
I don't know. Jockish not, stereotype. Yeah, 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 which is not totally. the case at all. Like, there are a ton of athletes that are great, but he sounds, he just sounds like a, and he can also fucking do renovations. Like, yeah. And he has a mustache. 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 <laughs> mustache. A mustache. But I mean, seriously, mustache can do renovations and fix shit around your house. Dreamboat. And this was the Dream 80s, boat. so the mustache was very popular. Fuck yeah. I mean, it still is popular with me, but it's uh, fine. I mean, okay. I'll, I'll give it a pass because it's the 80s. <laughs> so although Andre usually lived at home with his parents, at the time he was house-sitting for his brother Chris, who was on vacation. And when the day's work was done, Andre usually stopped off at his brother's place to feed his brother's cats, wash up. Oh. Uh, then he got into his black Ford pickup and drove to uh, a restaurant called uh, Chi-Chi's Mexican Restaurant. Um and would usually meet friends there um, for dinner. Um, so afterwards, uh, on one particular instance, uh, him and a friend uh, decided to shoot some pool. So they spotted a bar that had a pool table. It was kind of like a little hole in the wall, like nondescript place mm. um, called Mitchell's Lounge. And they had never been they had never been before. So they just thought that it was like a really cool, like little uh, hole in the wall place. And you know, mm. like oh, this looks like you know we'll shoot some pool or whatever Mm -hmm. um so they played for a little bit um played for beers supposedly Mm -hmm. uh loser pays as always and it was only after he had won the first game and stood watching uh andre walk over to the bar to buy a round that nick his friend that he was with noticed a woman Mm -hmm. she was sitting at the bar drinking she was had like smallish, round face, brunette features, um, described as not unattractive. Okay. <laughs> uh, she introduced herself to Andre as he waited for the beers. Each time Andre went to the bar, the woman who said her name was Thelma engaged him in conversation. When the men were about to leave, she stopped Andre and asked for a ride. Hell yeah. Thelma was like, I'm about this tall, dark, and handsome, beautiful man with this mustache and who can, looks like he can renovate my house. Yeah, she was about it all right. And has these abilities. Yeah. I feel like Thelma is not a good person. Thelma is not a good but person. But I do relate to <laughs> mysterious woman at bar trying to chat up this like handsome dream boat. No, she's not. No, she's not a good omen. Um So she asked for a ride. She didn't have a car. She needed to get home to check on a friend of hers who was pregnant. No, girl, but why are you here if you don't have a car, though? Like, why are you just hanging out in this fucking bar? (laughs) How'd you get here? How did you get here? They didn't have Uber back then. No. How did you get here, babe? Maybe a taxi, possibly. And if your friend is pregnant, then she's clearly sober. She can come get your fucking ass, Thelma. Right. Men don't ask these questions, you see, well, but women do. <laughs> well, Andre agreed. Um, he asked if Nick wanted to meet somewhere for another drink after Thelma had been dropped off. His friend was like, no, I'm good. Um, and later, Nick would recall that Thelma had an unsettling way of avoiding his eyes, turning her face from him, and at the time, he shrugged it off. Thelma got into Andre's truck, and they drove to an apartment complex in Kenner. The apartment building was also nondescript, like any of a hundred, like, inexpensive, two-story suburban apartment houses. Got so, yeah. Um, so, for whatever reason, Andrea accompanied Thelma into her apartment. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I thought she was going to check on her pregnant friend, not to her well, apartment. Well, into the apartment, I guess. Oh, okay. I mean, technically, I guess in, in the writing, it's, like, into her apartment. I mean, there yeah. is no friend. There is no pregnant friend. Clearly, Let me put that's it that a fucking way. lie, but... <laughs> right. Um, so whether or not they, th- he thought that it was for like a nightcap or like something sexual or whatever, you know, whatever else it was, like nobody really knows why he went in, mm. in there with her mm. or what she said to coerce him into right, right. going. Um, she, Thelma's never made a statement about, about that part. All we know about the subsequent events are in the confessions of a one Charles Gervais and Michael Phillips, the convicted killers of Andre. Charles Gervais was almost the same age as Andre, which makes the contrast between them all more striking. They seem like um, they were kind of very... um, Where Andre was handsome and helpful, athletic, and all of this, Gervais was like short, thin, scruffy, 
alienated, kind of considered mm-hmm. like a loner. Um, a fucking like, oh, what are they called? What are they? A fucking incel. Yeah, he Sounds was like. Uh, according to this, according to his lawyer, he like grew up with an abusive father and had really just been kind of like a trouble, a troubled teen, I guess. Yeah. Um, so when he when they came together, Gervais and Andre, Gervais had actually been out of prison for only just a few months, uh, having done time for burglary, uh, and he was living with Michael and Thelma, um, in this apartment in Kenner. Um. Phillips, the other man, was short, like Gervais, um, but had sort of lanky blonde hair down to his shoulders, was also a troublemaker, um, and just kind of like very much the petty criminal type, and also described as being a completely unremarkable person. (laughs) (laughs) What a read. (laughs) That was from his lawyer. Wow. (laughs) Completely unremarkable person. He and Thelma, his girlfriend, probably met Gervais in a bar. The three of them were, by some accounts, heavily into drugs, um, even though no drugs or paraphernalia were discovered. Um, so yeah, of course not, because they did all the fucking they drugs. Did all the drugs, probably. Yes. Um, all accounts agree, however, that the couple fell under the influence of Gervais, who was several years their senior and was kind of the ringleader of the group i guess and he had like this deranged mixture of like cold-hearted remorselessness and like these weird delusions of like grandeur i guess got it so uh definitely not two qualities that you would pick for your D character no you would not <laughs> so he was so you have gervais who was kind of like the brains um of this whole situation um So Gervais moved in with the Phillips and drew them into his plans for future greatness, supposedly. Future dumb fuckery, actually. The three of them would acquire a vehicle, some seed money, and an arsenal of weapons, then set out for Houston to take over a vast prostitution ring by wiping out the mafia family that controlled it. No. That was their plan. You are a dumb shit. No, right. you are a dumb shit. This mafia family is like organized crime. Like these people are also dumb shits, but they're like professional dumb shits. Yep. And you are like, what are you doing? Yep. Just fucking do this dime bag and shut the fuck <laughs> up. Like I hate people like this. So before Gervais could trust Phillips um, to, I guess, partake in this adventure... Phillips would have to prove himself. He would have to show he was man enough to kill someone. It was decided, according to statements by both men, that Thelma would lure a victim back to the apartment. Uh, Thel- Thelma had gone to two bars without netting a victim. <laughs> because I'm sure there were some men that were like, nah, you you ain't right. Until, for- unfortunately, they happened upon the one person <laughs> who would like... like they were like, Who look, was my like, wife probably... has told me that I am not worth this. <laughs> like, I am not worth them men a woman the other to speak said, to me. Them a man at the other bar said, nah, my ex-wife name was Thelma. I ain't good. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I ain't gonna mess with it. No, that that man, one of the men that she approached, she's just like, no, my wife tells me every day I'm a fucking idiot. I don't trust this. This is suspicious. Right. I am not attractive enough for you to want me to take you home. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, they had, she got the innocent one here. I mean, they would all be innocent, but, you know. Yeah. Um, the one that actually probably honestly is good looking and talented and yes. approachable enough to, you know, probably had women wanting to take him home, wanting him to take them home all the time. <laughs> right. So these are statements made by Charles. Um, one week after the murder. So after she brought him, Andre, into the apartment, Thelma told him that she had to go see about a friend who was pregnant. She left and went up to her bedroom, and he fell asleep on the couch. I'm going to assume that maybe he had been drinking, but I'm not going to put that out there. Know. But um, according to them, he fell asleep on the couch. Also, what fucking time of night it is, is it? Because pregnant ladies are asleep late at night. <laughs> I guess. Like, what the fuck? Like, we just don't go to make house calls. Gervais said that me and Michael passed the hammer back and forth, arguing over who was going to hit him first. After about four or five hours of that, Michael hit him four times and run to tell Thelma. 
Then he gave me the hammer and told me to hit him a few times because he was moving around and moaning. I hit him two or three times. He was moaning real loud, so Michael hit him four more times with the hammer. We thought he was dead. We dragged him into the hall, and he started moving again, and Michael got the hammer and hit him three more times. I told Michael the hammer wasn't working, so we got a coat hanger and tried to strangle him. Then we cut the wire off the vacuum cleaner and tried to strangle him with that while jumping up and down on his back. And Fucking idiots. It was nearly dawn by the time they had finally succeeded in killing him. Um, they turned down the air conditioner as far as it would go so the body would not decompose. The next day, they wrapped Andre's body in drapes and stuffed it inside um, a couch or the couch on which he had fallen asleep on the night before. Uh, then they nailed boards across the bottom to keep it secure. That afternoon, the apartment manager made a surprise visit. Sitting on the sofa, Gervais explained that they were moving out and that the dark red puddles on the floor were spilled paint, which they would clean up. Where's the, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, where's this, the red? What's red? Where's the accent wall, babe? <laughs> yeah, we just got the paint out and we, we were trying to do a new thing. Um, you might have seen it in Good Housekeeping. It's called an accent floor, um, but we only did a couple like large swaths suspicious looking uh swaths on the on the carpet <sighs> idiots, yeah idiots fucking uh, idiots i mean pretty much um so then they later loaded the sofa into andre's own truck and drove out the um drove out to the swamp where uh where they dumped the body so at this point um the family recognizes we're going back. They recognize that he is missing. Um, so it was in the midst of all this that um, Elise called from California with the news that she had an appointment to see a psychic. The psychic reading was set for Saturday afternoon. Elise was told to bring a photo of her missing brother and a map of Louisiana. All she could find by way of photo was a group shot from the 1960s of the Daigle brothers, all with long hair and bell bottoms. Rosemary Kerr, the psychic, was, to Elisa's surprise, uh, she was a small woman. She was a husky woman. Um, Bless her. Bless her little husky heart. Described as unexceptional in manner of dress. Okay. <laughs> uh, who kind of looked like uh, a run-of-the-mill housewife. Got it. Uh, in fact, she habitually describes herself, or Kerr herself, to Describes her own self as a little old Italian grandmother. Bless her. Kerr had discovered her gift at the age of four in Brooklyn, where she grew up in an immigrant uh, Neapolitan family. What is Neapolitan? Do you know? What does that mean? I mean. I mean. So I understand that it probably. Because I, I mean, this okay. might, I don't want to be offensive, but I think ice cream. Chocolate, vanilla, <laughs> strawberry. Okay, here we go. Here's what we're going to do. So. Neapolitan ice cream, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. Varied, multi-flavored. Okay. So potentially a Neapolitan family would be like multi-ethnic. Okay, we'll go with that. Perhaps. All right. Would be my explanation. Well, yeah. So she grew up in a Neapolitan family that lived above their father's candy store. She had awakened one night screaming from a nightmare about a house in flames. A few weeks later, an uncle who lived across the street locked his wife and child in a bathroom and set their house on fire. This incident in Kerr's eyes set a pattern for her life. She realized uh, she could get information intuitively from the psychic realm and that her gift would be tied to families, particularly those with children in danger. Mm. She later discovered she had a special talent for finding missing persons. So we're kind of going back to that, like what we talked about a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, but hopefully we'll see like a different side mm -hmm. to this. Um she said, I don't want to be told anything about the person or the circumstances, she explains. I don't even look at the picture. I close my eyes. First, I say a prayer, a protection prayer, calling God down, for this all comes through the power of God. Mm -hmm. Then I give things out exactly as I receive them. Sometimes I don't even remember what I said. That's why I always tape my readings. Kerr closed her eyes and began rubbing the picture. Soon she complained of a headache. A very horrible headache. She said, my head is killing me. And then she mm. cried. Next, she saw a black car or truck. 
Elise then said, but Andre drives a white car. Black, Kerr insisted, and there is a person with long blonde hair near him who has some sort of power over him. Moving on to the map, Kerr, again with her eyes closed, ran her finger over the state of Louisiana, which she had never visited, supposedly. She said she saw water, a long low bridge over water, and a long beach, and the number seven. Hmm. Andre's body was found by exit seven, just off the elevated highway on a little strip of sand in the Manchang Swamp. And then her fingers started to tingle. She stopped, opened her eyes, and read the name of the town beneath her fingers, Slidell. Go there, she said. Oh my god. This case took place, place in Slidell? Yeah. Shit, I've been there. Yeah. Go there, she said. I'm getting a strong confirmation, lady. Go there quickly. So it was nearly midnight in Louisiana when Elise uh, called with the psychic's message. The little band of friends and family had been out all day searching, and now they were ready to turn in. But an odd, overwhelming emotion swept the group. Everyone felt it, remembers Chris Daigle. We all got goosebumps, started crying. We knew somehow this was it. We ran out into the yard, and my sister said a prayer. Then we jumped into three cars and started out towards Slidell. I was driving. Joey, Nick, and my wife, Virginia, were with me. We all kept talking to Andre, telling him we were coming, because that's what the psychic said we should do. Mm. As we were going down the interstate just before the five-mile bridge to Slidell, Joey shouts, That's it. That's mm-hmm. the truck. Joey knew because he recognized the scratch mark on the side. I pull alongside, and there is Andre's truck with the two guys driving it. Now, in this, I'm going to pause because I'm not entirely sure what the discrepancy between the white car. His sister said that he drew, he drove a white car, and this was a black truck. Yeah, because early on in the story, you said that yeah. he drove a black. Um, I'm not entirely sure of what that discrepancy is, if that's just like if she had been away and thought that he had a white car. Yeah. Maybe she, the sister was... I don't Maybe know. he used to have a white car. Well, he used to have a white car, truck. and now he's got a black truck. I'm not entirely sure, yeah. but I just wanted to point that out. Got I'm not it. really sure what that like discrepancy where that came from. Well, didn't you say um, he changed cars? But the truck was when he got the truck was Andre's. Okay, okay. Um. So so they're driving down the interstate. They see his truck. Um. I pull alongside, and there's Andre's truck with two guys driving it. So I fall back and yell to my sister in the other car. You get off and call mom. Tell her to call the police, um, city, state, everyone. Tell them we are going east on the I-10. My sister exits and we keep on behind the truck, but then I can tell they realize they are being followed. They start trying to fake us out, making like they're going to exit, and then at the last minute, swerving back onto the road, um, but I stay with them. So we ride like this for a while, and then I see the road is coming to a dead end, and the truck pulls up at the dead end and turns around, and the lights go off, like they're waiting for us. About 50 yards from the dead end, there is a bathroom, a bar room. So I stop, and Nick runs in to call the police. Just then, the truck's lights come back on, and it starts inching toward us, going real slow. I tell Virginia to lie down on the floorboards, and Joey, who, was, who has a .38 with him, and I open the car doors and crouch behind them, using them as shields. When the truck gets up alongside and they see us crouching like that, I don't know what they thought. Maybe that we're cops or something, but they take off hauling ass. We take off after them, and by some miracle, there on this deserted road we had just driven down maybe five minutes before, there is now a police car parked. We start yelling all of us at once, but the cop can't follow what we're trying to say, so Virginia shows him the flyer with Andre's picture, and the cops gives chase. Uh, we followed behind, all of us going around 100 miles an hour. So, when Pearl River Police Chief Benny Rayner saw the two scruffy-looking white male prisoners, he thought he was dealing with nothing more than a stolen truck, although the Magnum pistol and the 9mm gun uh, that were found in the truck's cab gave him pause for thought. Michael Phillips was brought into the chief's office first. Phillips said he didn't know anything. Gervais had shown up with the truck at their hotel. That's all. He wouldn't answer any more questions and that he wanted an attorney. Next came Gervais. He wouldn't answer any questions without an attorney. Period. Because you know he's that, he's that motherfucker. Yeah. The chief was ready to give fucking up. stupid. Gonna take down an organized crime like mafia fucking. Yeah. Sure. The chief was ready to give up but decided to try Phillips again. This time Phillips said Gervais had picked him up at his sister's house. 
Um, so he, he's, the police chief was like, well, which is it? So he handed Phillips a pencil and paper and told him to write down one statement or the other for the record. When Gervais saw Phillips writing down what he took to be a much more damning statement, one that would perhaps throw all the blame on himself, he jumped and demanded to see the chief. As soon as he entered the office for the second time, Gervais shouted to the chief's amaz- amazement, all right, we did it. We killed him. The chief is probably like, the fuck? Yeah, pretty like- much. <laughs> Yep. Um, So it took more than a year and a half before the events of that week finally came to a resolution. Charles Dervais pleaded guilty 10 years ago this month. Now, again, this was back in 1997 um, to second degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without benefit of pardon, probation or parole. But he did manage to achieve briefly the notoriety he so coveted, like that of his acknowledged hero... Charles Manson. Oh, my fucking God. <laughs> These people never make your hero Charles Manson. He was a piece of shit. He couldn't even fucking steal a car. He couldn't even steal a car. Like, oh, my God. Do not make that man your hero. Yeah. Make your hero fucking Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin. I yep. don't know why I'm like into the astronauts, but like not that guy. Right. Definitely not him. But this notoriety, notoriety that he coveted, he done, he got that by announcing that Andre's murder had actually been committed as, guess what? An initiation right into a cult of Satan worshippers oh who God. operate in the New Orleans warehouse district. Great. Satanist. No, it was Satanism for sure. No, you're no. a fucking idiot and you Exactly. Like you were literally a nothing and you just sat around doing drugs and the only thing that your stupid ass numbskull brain could think of to do to gain yourself any remote level of notoriety was fucking murder an innocent man who was just trying to be a good fucking person driving this woman home from the bar. Yep. So yeah. So pretty much they all got locked away. Um Michael Phillips also pleaded guilty to second degree murder. Not that they got away, sorry, but that they they all got locked up essentially. Duh. Yeah. So, <laughs> they did not <laughs> they get, didn't away get away because they were fucking idiots. Um, Thelma Horn stood trial and was convicted of murder. All of them are serving life sentences. Wow! So they convicted her of murder. Yes. Even though allegedly, the way the story goes, she was not present for the yeah. actual murder. They convicted the that bitch of murder. Mm-hmm. Yep. Fair. Here we go. All right, Louisiana. Um, <laughs> it's me clapping for you. So, th- when this was written a decade after the convictions, Kerr stays in touch with the Daigle family and with Prosecutor LeBlanc, for whom she has done additional forensic readings. Kerr credits the family's love and dedications as mm. much as her own paranormal gifts with the solving of the murder, as though some um, concerted energy of goodness had overtaken and vanquished a vicious but ultimately less potent force of evil. Mm. Throughout the exhausting series of trials, mistrials, and motions that were required before the cases were closed, the courtroom was always packed with friends and family. Mm. Um at his funeral services in St. Matthew's Church, there were no empty seats and barely room to stand. And a huge mm-hmm. silent crowd followed the casket to Garden of Memory Cemetery where he was laid to rest. His headstone reads, loved by so many. So. I'm literally crying. <laughs> I am like, I know. Uh, it was really hard for me to get through this too. It oh was, God. It, was, it was really hard for me to get through this. Well, what's horror, like, what is, like, and I'm sorry if you said it at the beginning, but I just did not catch it. But, like, I didn't realize this was in Slidell. Like, I've been there. I know where Exit 7 is. Like, I know where that is. Mm-hmm. Um, ugh, it's awful. It's yeah. awful. Yeah. Awful, awful, awful. <sighs> wow, that family. Ugh. <sighs> now I'm sniffing for different reasons. <laughs> ugh, I think, fuck. um, I... That family, man. Like, obviously, this is such a tragic story. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's one that I definitely wanted to tell because... And I didn't even do this without, like, knowing exactly what all you were going to talk about. Yeah. But it just kind of shows to me that she... Like, the circumstances were very similar to what other psychics have been in. You know what I mean? Like, she... 
has there's a missing person it's a it's a yeah so you know what i mean it's like right. it kind of falls into that but like instead the way of somebody who comes in and exploits the situation right you know she, she kind of comes in and, and she doesn't credit it all no. to herself she's no. like and that's the thing like she's like listen this family had an immense amount of energy right dedicated to this and like which probably that, amplified yes. and and helped kind of act as a conduit for her to be keyed into the situation. The way that like, she tells I, them to talk to him yeah. while they were trying to like yeah. find him. Yeah. Um the way that she gives I mean she did give kind of sp- semi specific information. I mean but not not totally. I mean, you know, there was water, there was yeah. seven, there was this that we yeah. had talked about. Well, I think she didn't she try did to necessarily, them. she didn't try to draw the lines herself and connect the dots herself right. and say, he was kind of by like these how we two were, men, right. they dropped him off right. on exit seven. Kind like, of like how we were talking about like red, like with the red jacket, she saw the number seven. She yes. didn't say exit seven. She didn't say house number seven. She didn't make up other shit to kind of put it in context. She just said, look, I'm seeing the number seven. Yes. This is a thing. Um, and then, you know, she also, like, another thing that I want to mention is that, yes, we get very, um, you know, we don't talk a lot about God and Christianity on the show and all of that, but there's something that I, found, I find really uh, impactful about her bringing her religion into this. Yeah. Um, because that's not always, like, a lot of the time psychics are seen as, like, devil worshipers it's seen as witchcraft it's seen as this and it's seen as that well for me a lot of the times when you're do you know when you're looking at a case that involves a psychic there's um there's a certain personality type that i think is ascribed to people like that and it's more the sylvia brown type of personality where the psychic is like all-knowing and the psychic is like so intelligent and blah blah blah, and they have the power and the power is somehow incarnate within them personally and what i appreciated about about kerr about the psychic in this case um she the first thing she does is sit down and pray to a power that is higher than her mm-hmm. um that she views as you know she doesn't just have this power because it's incarnate in her and she's the best motherfucker ever she's the best thing since sliced bread she has this power because a power greater than her has endowed her with the opportunity to tap into this force to use it for good and that's the same, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't matter if she was praying to a Christian God or if she was praying to Satan or if she was praying to, you know, some other force outside herself. She is still kind of crediting the actual power itself outside of herself. She's not just saying, oh, well, I'm all powerful. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and instead, she's kind of taking her place as a conduit. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I, I just love the family in this case. But I do have to say, if you're in a situation like that, don't give chase. Get the police to like don't don't like get out of your car and like use your door as shields. Like that's not safe for you. And it very easily could have ended up. I mean, these people were fucking idiots. The perps were fucking idiots. The perpetrators. Um, but you know, it very could have easily ended up in a situation that would be really really bad. Yeah. Where we could have had more death. So yeah. if it, that was probably not advisable. Um, well, they did I, what they needed to in the situation. But if you're in that situation and you're listening, don't do that. Um, and the other thing is the friend Nick, I know that he probably feels so fucking bad. But like straight dudes who are out at bars, please do not be afraid to accompany your friends if they are being chatted up by a strange person. Yeah. Please do not be afraid to say, hey, this is not safe. I know that, like, there's a whole thing and, like, it was a woman and, like, a, a, a man's man should be able to handle himself against a woman and blah, blah, blah. And she's, you know, she doesn't look fucking dangerous, but she was fucking dangerous. Yeah. Like, please look out for your bros and don't let them leave the bar with mysterious women. Yeah, I mean, especially, like, I mean, I, I'm not trying to, like, it, yeah, I'm not. 
I mean, I'm sure that he feels really bad and, and he made the decision, you know, it was the 80s. It was a different sort of situation. It was a different time. We have no idea what was actually said. And, you know, everybody's been in that situation where your friend wants to leave the club with somebody that they've met there, mm -hmm. right? For some people, that's why they go to the club. But I am always the overbearing fucking mom jeans friend who will be like, um, no. Like, you can meet him and have a coffee with him. <laughs> you can go fuck him in the bathroom if you want. Like, I have some condoms. Do you need that? Like, it's a weird mom. But, like, you're not going to go home with him because we don't know where his home is. And, like, we don't know who's at his fucking home. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's true. No, don't let your friends and straight men, don't be afraid to do that for your straight friends. Like, don't you be protective. That's yours. That's your friend. Yeah, totally. I'm very protective of my friends. I'm like, look. No, <laughs> it's not going to happen. You can go out back. Make out in the corner all you want to. Make out in the corner, yeah. give him a little handy. It's fine. Get under the table. I'll even sit in front. I got thick legs. <laughs> I can block a lot. Like, but we're not doing this. Yeah. So anyway, I just feel like that type of thing, you know, should be said in a case like this because that there were a lot of opportunities where you know potentially this could have been averted and stuff unfortunately stuff like this happens all the time to people like Andre who are you know making the world a better place by being here and it's really unfortunate I know the part about feeding the cats gets me I'm like yeah, mm. yeah. this is why you stay a rude ass motherfucker you don't take people home <laughs> yeah just I mean just question don't take people home why don't. just like we did like you know she has to go visit her pregnant friend and she needs a ride home okay but how did you get here why are you here now if you have this pregnant friend that you need to go visit? Mm -hmm. Why are you visiting this pregnant friend? I mean, they're at a bar and it's the evening, so I'm imagining <laughs> it's not early. Like, why are you visiting this pregnant friend at, like, 11 o'clock at night? And, you know, and I feel like it's a little bit easier now because there's, like, taxis and Uber. and But there are some right. rural areas where that's not a thing. I, I could just, Slidell is one of them. Yeah. I could imagine it's, like, 2019 and this, like same situation and the girl's like well i just i don't have a ride and the guy's like you want me to call you an uber like, yeah but yeah <laughs> and then it's just like that's the end right yeah which we can say that but i mean even now i mean i was in slide all a couple of years ago and there's still not a lot of uber options right i mean you right, can right. try but there's a lot of parts of the country where uber's just not a thing um yeah. And they're a fucking fucked up company of their own accord that's a different kind of crime <laughs> but <laughs> Um, Fucking yeah, just, just don't, don't be afraid to take care of your friends. Don't, don't be afraid to be overbearing. I have always said that I'd rather be the overbearing mom friend than lose a friend. So take that to heart. Yeah. And again, that's not a read on Nick. That's not like coming down on him. We have no idea what was said. We have no idea what the situation was. He could have done all of those things, and Andre could have felt perfectly comfortable doing like, what no, he did I anyway. Yeah. So, but that's just me telling you in the future, or us telling you, I guess I should say. Me. <laughs> Again, overprotective mom friend. <laughs> this is me telling No, yes, Now it I'm is mothering you. you. No, it is you, because I am probably, unfortunately, that friend that will just, oh, where'd she go? Oh, that okay. will just let your fucking ass yeah. go. I, I'm like yeah. trying to think the number of times that I've been in the club, and I'm like, yeah. No. Yeah. I'm always Where am I? The in the corner drinking. <laughs> in the corner drinking like a quarter of a drink and then handing it to me. And then I and then I get drunk not of my own volition. <laughs> That's a thing. That's the thing that Kenny does when he gets drunk. He orders more drinks. Like he keeps ordering drinks, but he drinks a quarter of them and then he hands them to me. And I'm like, well, I didn't And then I order another drink. And then he goes immediately to go get another one. I'm like, why are you doing this? Are you like an ogre like hoarding like rocks but it's just alcohol like what is the thing anyway Fun. uh i'm glad we can have that laugh because yeah. that was really that was a really depressing case also why have not heard why have i not heard that fucking story i don't know like i haven't heard anybody cover that case okay well boom mm. i guess i can come mm. <laughs> i guess you know when i want to do cases i can do a case critical i'm critical of that why has that not been covered hmm. but 
But thank you guys for listening. Uh, it's time for us to go now, though. It is. It's time for us to get the fuck out of here. We have to visit our pregnant friend, you see. <laughs> Just kidding. We don't have pregnant friends. I have some. <laughs> I have I have those. You know what friends that I have that are pregnant? I have those like old friends from high school that I wasn't even friends with in high school, really. Yeah. Who are like all having children. But I'm Facebook friends with them now. And it's like we never actually interacted when we were like in real life, like going to high school and shit, but like now we're Facebook friends and we'll be for life. And I just like watch their children. Like I watch them get pregnant and have children and I watch their kids grow up yeah. online. And I'm like, they post, I wait for the first day of school posts and they're like, Oh, first day of school for like little Janie. And I'm like, fuck yeah. Janie's going to have a great year. Like, <laughs> hell yeah. She's going to tell them girl. And I'm like, why, why is this? I don't know. It's a very You're interesting weird. relationship. I really root for them. I truly do. You're weird. I don't have <laughs> pregnant friends. I, you're my only friend. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not happening for a while. <laughs> little did they know. Yeah. No. Little did they know. There's no way. No. In hell. Not well, I guess there is a way in hell. There is a way Any in Christ hell. Any Christ's got to get here somehow. You would be the, the anti-Mary. <laughs> the Maria. <laughs> 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 anyway. We have to get the fuck out of here. Um, check us out online if you want to. I, I feel like that was a very 1997 way to say that. <laughs> check us out on the World Wide Web. Check us out on AOL. <laughs> we're on Instagram at The Haunted Heart Podcast. We're on Twitter at The Haunted Heart. Um, we're also on Facebook. You can join our closed Facebook group. It is closed for your privacy. I know some of you guys might not be as spooky out in the open with your spook in life, and that is totally fine. Um, if you request to join either Kenny, myself, or a member of our Murder Mod Squad, we'll approve you and then only you and other folks in the group can see what you post there. Um, not your fucking Aunt Margaret, who's going to get upset with you and tell you you need to come back to Jesus. Anywho, um, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash The Haunted Heart. We have a whole bunch of bonus content there for you guys. We have scary stories. We have spooky smut, which is exactly what the fuck it sounds like. It is um, us reading and digesting and making fun of <laughs> horror-themed porn stories yeah, that yeah. people write, yeah. apparently. Um, and we drop a bonus, like, full episode on there and a lot of odds and ends and shit like that. So bloopers and shit. Yeah. We have those. We have it for you. We, do. we have this. Even though sometimes it seems like the whole show's a blooper. Anywho. I think that's it. Is yeah, that all the it. shit I that we that's have? Not, that's pretty much it. I think you covered everything. Uh... I don't think that's it. I think the only thing that we have left to do tonight is to tell you, you know what you gotta do. You gotta stay spooky. spooky.